So I will let a few more folks trickle in as we get started, but I'll start with the welcoming remarks. So hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today for our session um, on sustainable urbanscapes with Nandita Basu. This is the sixth in our Lake Futures webinar series and our last se session for this September. Uh, my name is Kirsten Grant and I'm the project coordinator with Lake Futures, a project based out of the University of Waterloo. But like many of you here, I'm joining you from my home today. So I wanted to start by acknowledging that we're all participating today from traditional territories of the first people across this country. I'm currently in Sarnia, Ontario and acknowledge that the land which I'm on is traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, specifically of Amjanong First Nation. I would also encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional lands where you are. Um, Nandita, if you wanna to move to the next slide. So today's event is being hosted by Lake Futures, which is based out of the University of Waterloo and led by Dr. Nandita Basu, who we'll be hearing from today. The project involves over 20 researchers from four different universities. It's a seven year long multidisciplinary project that aims to deliver adaptive watershed and lake management solutions that minimize trade-offs between lake ecosystems, water uses and economic growth. And as we finish up year three of the project, we decided to start this webinar series to link our findings with external practitioners and other researchers. Um, our goals of this series are to share our latest findings, discuss implications for how this research might be used to inform water policies, programs and plans in Ontario, and promote dialogue between researchers, partners, and our stakeholders to inform the next phase of our research program. Um, Lake Futures is also a project under the Global Water Futures Program, which is the world's largest university-led water research program, with the goal of delivering risk management solutions for managing water in Canada and other cold regions informed by leading edge water science. Next slide, Nandita. So some quick logistics before we get started. We'll ask that you please use the Q&A feature to post all questions and then use the chat box to share any general comments, ideas, or to engage in dialogue with other participants. Um, this webinar will also be recorded to view later. So for today's format, we'll begin with a presentation from Dr. Nandita Basu, followed by Q&A. We're hoping for this to be a two-way dialogue, um, but recognize that that's a challenge in this webinar format. So as the pre presentation goes on, we'd encourage you to share your thoughts in the chat box or questions in the Q&A box as we go. Before we get started, um, we're gonna start with a poll to help us gauge our audience today. So I'll ask my colleague Nancy to start that now. And we're looking for um, which, best, rec which be best represents your organization, whether that's government, non-government, an academic institution, industry or consulting, or maybe you're an other. So we'll leave that for a few moments to get some responses in. Great, so it seems like we've got a lot of folks from academic institutions joining us today. Um, and quite a few from government as well, and a handful from NGOs and others. So it's nice to see a mix of agencies and interests today, and it's nice to have you join us. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Nandita Basu is an associate professor cross-appointed between civil and environmental engineering and earth and environmental sciences at the University of Waterloo. She's the principal investigator of Lake Futures the director of the Collaborative Water Program with the Water Institute at the University of Waterloo. In 2019, she was also honored as a member of the Royal Society of Canada's College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists. So welcome, Nandita, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you all um, for attending today's webinar. Oops. 
really happy to be here today talking to you about uh, some research that was undertaken as a part of Lake Futures, specifically looking at urban areas and how nutrients are cycled in urban areas. What I'm presenting today is a work that was done by a master's student working in our group, Melanie Ivy Sampson, and she was also uh, mentored by Dr. Kimberly Van Meter, who was a postdoc working with their group at that time and now is a professor in Chicago. So before, before jumping into this project, I just again wanted to thank my lab group, the funding agencies, uh, and the circles are, uh, there's Melanie over here, and there is um, Kim Van Meter at the back. So why cities? Well, cities are really important if you think about how uh, landscapes are going to evolve in the next 50, 100 years. There is a UN report that talked about the fact that by 2050, two thirds of the global population would be living in, in cities. Currently, it's about 50% or so. so. So people are migrating to cities from uh, surrounding rural areas. Uh, city because there is a high population density resources are cycled in very different ways in cities than in um, nearby urban and rural areas. Thus, people have been really interested in how to manage cities. Uh, what is the weight of cities? What is the resource requirement of cities? And how can we manage cities so that uh, we are more efficient in the way we cycle our, our resources? Cities are both a challenge and an opportunity. The challenge being that you have this density of human population. So talk about any kind of resource consumption or pollution, cities are really these hotspots opportunity because uh, there is also a lot of brain power and money power in cities. There is also potential to use all these resources in an environmentally and economically sustainable way. And that's kind of, where our interests in cities come from. The other attributes that's very characteristic of cities is their proximity to water bodies. A lot of, if you think about a lot of large cities around the world, Chicago, New York, they're, they're built around water bodies. And the reasons of course are obvious, right? But because of their proximity to water bodies, cities also impact uh, the water environment, things you do on the land impact the water because you are in close proximity to the water. Um, if there are people from Toronto, uh, you're familiar with uh, beach closures around Toronto area. Uh, several, this, this is an article uh, that came out in the Toronto Star this year in July. Uh, again, uh, several beaches are unsafe. A lot of it times it is unsafe because of E. coli pollution, but there are other reasons of, of nuisance algal blooms around the beaches uh, that lead to their closures. So the proximity of urban areas uh, to water uh, threatens water much more than in other regions. To think, about, uh, to think about cities and how they process nutrients, one of the ways we thought about it is, is this idea called an urban metabolism. And what is it? So thinking about city as an organism that has its inputs and outputs. So in the case of nutrients that a lot of us work on, inputs are nitrogen and are phosphorus and outputs are waste. Similarly, you have water coming in and waste going out. So it's like an or organism, it's like a human body processes these inputs and outputs, cities do the same. And the waste of cities is of course the wastewater treatment plants and the waste management system uh, that are the outputs of the system. And the questions that we ask, if you think about cities as organisms, is can we recycle the waste more effectively? And can we, for example, if there is a lot of uh, solid waste and landfills can be composted and use it in our, agri uh, in our agricultural system or on our fertilizers. That's kind of one of the motivations of this work. Can we think about more uh, resource um, neutral cities? So as an example, most, most cities right now work on this linear economy, which means that there's inputs and there's waste, right? So for example, a lot of the inputs to the city of Toronto ends up in landfill. And as population is expanding, 
uh, space is getting more and more scarce, it's not easy to find uh, land areas that are available for landfills. And even when you do find land, land areas, those landfills uh, leak and they um, produce risk to nearby water quality. There's also, of course, um, wastewater treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants that discharge nutrients to nearby uh, lake, lake areas and that leads to coastal algal blooms, coastal eutrophication issues. Uh, again, this is going back to what I was talking about, Toronto beach closures. So this kind of uh, linearity in our economy, so input goes to output, leads to a lot of waste generated in cities that that impacts the nearby uh, um, land as well as water bodies, and can we manage these cities more effectively? So that brings to the three research questions that drove Melanie's work. The first question is along the lines of this broad urban metabolism idea. What role do cities play in partitioning nitrogen and phosphorus flows across the urban, suburban, and rural interfaces? And nitrogen and phosphorus, because those are the two major nutrients that are also responsible for algal blooms um, that lead to beach closures. So this is one of the most important things about cities. Of course, there's other pollutants too. The second question is broadly along this idea of urban food, kind of zoning in on that environmental impact question and saying, how do cities affect the natural environment that surrounds the cities, the soils, the streams, the lakes? And finally, the main purpose of doing all of this is to think about ways in which cities can effectively manage their nutrients. Can we create a more circular economy to reduce nutrient pollution, to reduce impacts of the city? So with these three questions in our plate, Melanie started her work trying to look at the greater Toronto area. Now, the first question when you're wanting to do something like this is what is a city? How do we define city boundaries? And that's not an easy question because the way you define the boundary defines what kind of management choices you make. Uh, one of the things we found is that there's this report. This is a UN report on the world's cities. And they asked this question, what is a city? And they used uh, the Greater Toronto Area as an example because it's really unique in the way it's structured. So if you look um, on the right over here, that's the cartoon of the Greater Toronto Area, which is shown in left. And if you look at the three regions, the yellow regions, which is more the city proper, has 2.6 million people. If you go to the blue region, it's larger, it's 5.1 million people. But if you go to the red region, which is the metropolis around it, it's, uh, it's even larger in terms of population. What's more important, if you think about growth rates, the city proper, which is the Toronto area, has been growing, but not that much, at only at a rate of 0.9%. While if you go from the city pro proper out in the suburban and uh, rural areas, the population growth, rates are much more dramatic. So if you look forward to the future, that's where we expect a lot of more population growth happening in the next few decades, which is why we felt it was important to focus not only on the city proper itself, but also the surrounding area. And that's what made us decide on the greater Toronto area as an example of a landscape. So what did we want to do with the Greater Toronto Area? One of the things we wanted to do is kind of to separate it into rural, suburban, and urban areas. So we used some criteria about population density, and we used agricultural census population density maps and overlay on that um, municipal uh, city boundaries to come up with areas that we designated as urban, suburban, and rural. So what you see in the image is after this designation, so the red area is more the urban area, which is very, very dense. The darker ochreish color is the suburban area, which is kind of that urban sprawl around it. And the yellow area is rural area, which is primarily dominated by agriculture. So now I wanted to talk you through a little bit of the methods of the study. How did we go about doing a nutrient mass budget of, uh, of the city by separating it out into the rural, suburban, and urban areas? And what you see in these arrows are the different uh, nutrient fluxes that are 
very unique to each of these three different areas. And one of the things we realized as soon as we were trying to do the mass balance is how both rich in data cities are, as well as how disparate the data sources are. They were all over the place. You could find information pretty much on anything, but the sources were really disparate. And this is where Melanie put in a huge amount of effort going through various archives, various databases, trying to collate this information together. And then we made assumptions, various assumptions to kind of take us from this sparse data that was available in various uh, various reports and of, of the different municipalities to a cohesive body of knowledge on nutrient cycling in this region. So if you think about the rural area as an example, and a lot of our previous work have focused on, on nutrient mass budgets in rural areas. So this was things that we were familiar with doing, but here is where you take account of the various uh, crops that are produced, various meat products, uh, import and export of agricultural products like crops and meat um, between uh, GTA and the surrounding landscape. So all that had to be taken into account in our rural mass budget. Uh, what was interesting was more uh, the suburban mass budget where uh, pets became a big component of the mass budget. And we found that we could actually find information on the different breeds of dog, as an example, and there were like 20 or 30 breeds of dog in urban and suburban um, Toronto area. And we found how many licenses were issued to each kind of dog. And then we made some estimate about what is the percent of dogs that are licensed versus not. And then we made estimates of how much pet waste is generated and what is the percent of the pet waste that is picked up versus not picked up and some of those numbers were available too. So we did all of that and then we put those in equations to estimate how much pet waste, both dog and cat, they were the two main things we considered was generated both in the urban and suburban area. The other big component of the urban and suburban nutrient budgets that took a lot of arm wrangling from Melanie's part was fertilizer application rate. So for that, we used, uh, we used available databases for places like cemeteries or golf courses, for buildings, for residential lawns. We separated the houses, uh, single dwelling or semi-detached houses, and made assumptions based on their footprint, on their lawn area, and thus their fertilizer application rates. We also used this database, which is the survey of household spending on fertilizer, and used a combination of that spending data with maps of the um, building footprints of cities to come up with fertilizer application rates for urban and suburban lawns. So now that we have figured out ways to have these different components of the input before going into the results, I wanted to show you kind of the, our conceptual understanding of nutrient flows across the greater Toronto area. And this was when we started out, we started out with one kind of conceptual understanding. And then as we move forward, this evolved as we started understanding a lot more about how the cities process nutrients. Now, since we're talking of cities, so these are the different subsystems. Since we're talking of cities, food is kind of the biggest component of the budget. Uh, I've said human food here because there's also pet food. So food's the biggest component of the budget. Where does that food go? So the first thing that we found, uh, which is really important, is that a certain fraction of this is food that we consume, but a large fraction of this is food that is wasted. And this is a large component of the budget. And this is important because this is a component where there are opportunities for recycling. There are opportunities for better management. So what happens to that food? Well, a lot of the consumed food goes through your wastewater treatment plants and some amount of it is septic system. So they treat a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus in the waste. Wasted food is a different story though, right? So a lot of it goes to landfill, some of it goes to compost. Ideally, more of it should go to compost and that could be recycled as agriculture, but does, does not happen very effectively. Now, 
the wastewater treatment plants, septic system, they remove some nutrients, but a lot of it is uh, discharged to surface water. So for example, if you're putting in nitrate through your wastewater treatment plant, it will reduce it, but then some nitrate will go out, same for phosphorus. The wastewater treatment plants and septic systems also generate uh, solids that uh, then go to the urban landscape. Now, there is also the other component is pet food. Pet food, of course, doesn't go through your wastewater treatment plant. It either goes to the landfill or, and this is when you're picking up your pet waste and, and disposing it off responsibly, or it can also go to the urban landscape when you're not picking it up. When it goes to the urban landscape, then it runs off to our surface water and again, pollutes our beaches. Now, where is this coming from? A lot of the food is imported. So you have imported food, imported detergent, imported pet food, and then you also have urban fertilizer that is also imported from elsewhere. So these are lawn fertilizers. The other source of human food is agricultural markets. So this is local food. So this is um, agriculture that is happening more in the rural fringes of the city. And that is supported by this, all these green boxes that capture the agricultural landscape. So you have pasture, feed, and crop. You have livestock, you have manure that goes onto your ag landscape and again shows up in your surface water. And the agricultural system needs feed. It needs fertilizer. And that is also something that's imported from outside the system. So all these red boxes are things that are entering the system from outside the system. And then the two big things that leave the system is food export and landfill. Uh, it's interesting, but one of the things we found is that Toronto has run out of its space for, for putting their waste in landfill. So a lot of landfill waste that is generated in Toronto actually goes to other regions. So now putting all that together and trying to look at these fluxes. So what you see in this image is this is done for nitrogen. Uh, the left-hand side of the image is input. The right-hand side of the circle is outputs. So the first thing that you note is that food is the largest component of the input. So this is this green area plus this green area plus this bluish and purple, um, bluish area. Consumed food, food waste, pet food, and livestock food. And like I mentioned, you see that consumed food and food waste are pretty similar in proportion. They're not that different. Uh, and pet food is a large component of the budget. So where does this food go? Well, a lot of it goes to our rivers and lakes. Some of it goes up in our landfill, and then a lot of it remains in the system as soil and groundwater. There's also denitrification that happens in the system because we're talking about nitrogen now. And then if you look at the difference, so this is nitrogen and this is phosphorus. Similar, all the left-hand side is inputs and the right-hand side is outputs. The things that's really interesting and different between nitrogen and phosphorus, if you look at landfill for phosphorus, it's a very big component of the budget. And that's because both uh, solid phosphorus, solid waste, biosolids from your wastewater treatment plant goes to landfill, um, your... Um, Wasted food goes to landfill, so there is no removal from the system like for nitrate, so a lot of it shows up in our landfill. The other thing is for nitrate, rivers and lakes are a larger component of the input. For phosphorus, it's smaller, and that has to do with the way phosphorus is, uh, is managed in Toronto or in, in the Great Lakes area. Phosphorus is known to cause these algal blooms, so we definitely discharge less phosphorus to the lake. Our wastewater treatment plants are much more eff effective in treating phosphorus than nitrogen just because we have invested more energy in it. So landfill is a big component for phosphorus. Rivers and lake is comparatively a smaller component than groundwater. So now let's take this a step further and ask the question, how does this pan out? So we kind of said this is this, what I've shown just now is at the aggregated Toronto scale. Well, what's happening in the specific urban, suburban and rural areas around Toronto? So the biggest thing that you see is the urban core is a hot spot. It has two to three times uh, larger nutrient input than the suburban or the rural areas. But of course, again, remember a large part of that urban nutrient input um, is, is food, food input. So even though it's a large component of the input, um, 
it doesn't matter much because it's routed through your wastewater treatment plants. So then we ask the question, let's, let's get into this piece. What is the footprint, right? So we said, well, food isn't creating that much of a footprint because most of it gets treated in wastewater treatment plants, but maybe fertilizers are a bigger impact. So we asked the question, what is the footprint of the greater Toronto area on soils, streams, and lakes surrounding it? So what you see in this image is phosphorus surplus. So this is inputs of phosphorus minus non-hydrologic phosphorus output. So any crop that you're taking out of your system. And this is the map of soil phosphorus surplus in the greater Toronto area calculated as the sum of its inputs and outputs, right? So we, we're not considering any runoff, though we recognize it's, it's important, but we don't have ability to do that at this scale right now. The biggest thing that I want you to note uh, in here is the relative amounts. What you see is that the phosphorus surpluses in urban areas are really large and they are concentrated along the lake shore. So if you look at the inputs of phosphorus in this system, uh, the green area is food, right? So this is, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned this. Uh, the box, the circle, the pie on the left-hand side is suburban and the pie on the right hand side is urban. So this is suburban, this is urban. So the thing that you see is in both food is a big, big component uh, of the input. It's a little bit bigger component in the ur urban area and a little bit smaller co component in the suburban area. The other big component, of course, with phosphorus is detergent. Um, Fertilizer, turf fertilizer is also a big component of the input. Uh, it's a little bit bigger component in the suburban area because there you have the lawns and you put a lot of fertilizer on there and a little smaller component. The other component that's important is food for pets because that becomes uh, pet waste in the system. And if you then look at phosphorus outputs from the system, what you see over here is yellow. So this is your urban, again, this is your suburban. Yellow is landfill. So landfill is definitely the biggest, biggest component of the output. Uh, but then the red area is what's building up in your soils or being lost to denitrification or groundwater. Um, the two other things to put your attention to, one is biosolids and fertilizer. So biosolids, uh, biosolids and wastewater treatment plant output. So those are two big components. And then you have compost that is produced. But the thing to remember about compost is that it has to be effectively used to be of value. Now, the two takeaways from, from this analysis was that pet waste and fertilizer were um, the two biggest components of the inputs uh, that didn't have a way to treat them effectively. So we wanted to see how they were concentrated. So what you see over here is, uh, is uh, pet nitrogen waste and pet phosphorus waste along the greater Toronto area. And again, the darker the color, the higher the concentrations in kilograms per hectare per year. One of the things we found really interesting and fun was that in nitrogen, we talk about atmospheric deposition a lot. We found that in this system, the, the inputs from uh, atmospheric deposition was 4.6 kilograms per hectare per year across the entire greater Toronto area. In contrast, uh, inputs of pet nitrogen waste was similar. It was about 4.5 kilograms per hectare per year across this region. If you focused in, if you focused in on the city of uh, Toronto, pet waste was about 20 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. So much more than atmospheric deposition. Atmospheric deposition is something we consider very, very seriously when we think about nitrogen pollution. Here we see pet waste is a smaller component of the water budget, of the nutrient pollution budget in this case. Similarly, here we have a pet waste that is concentrated in, um, for phosphorus. Now, it's important to remember that the way we calculated this, we actually took estimates that are available on how much pet waste um, do people pick up 
and that ranges from 40 to 60 percent. So this is considering that. So the pet waste that's picked up, we assume that it's picked up and disposed to landfills. This is considering the pet waste that has not been picked up. And if you think about this, this is pet waste that's not being picked up that is sitting in the grassy areas that is sitting uh, all over uh, across um, the waterfront. And what happens in this case is that when you have these large storm events, you have this pet waste flushing into your, into your lakes and to, uh, causing both nutrient pollution, uh, but also it's also responsible for any other pollutant uh, that you can think about, including E. coli. So pet waste is important, and it's important specifically to pick pet waste up if, if you're near the urban shores. The other big component of the budget was lawn fertilizer. And again, you see here fertilizer application rates in oops, fertilizer application rate near the shore is much, much higher than in the surrounding rural area. And one reason for that is in rural areas, you apply fertilizer and you take the crop and that goes out of your system. So there is a, a net drawing out of the fertilizer from the system. Whereas in urban areas, you have lawns and you're a lot of times over fertilizing your lawn. So these are creating the source of nutrients that are right there and ready to run off into, into the lake shows. In fact, um, studies have shown uh, that, uh, that sometimes practices like composting can actually aggravate some of these problems because when you have composting, you're applying all that compost uh, to your, um, to your soils in quite excess of, of what, what the soils need. And again, creating this uh, nutrient source that can run off um, to your water bodies. Of course, you also have your wastewater treatment plants and your wastewater treatment plants, all the circles that you see are wastewater treatment plants for phosphorus and, and nitrogen. And the darker the red color, uh, the more nitrogen or phosphorus they are uh, discharging. And these wastewater treatment plants are really efficient, but despite being really efficient, if you think about all these discharging into the lake, they cause these point source pollution issues that become especially important um, when, um, when you have these large storm events. So one of the things that happen during large storm events is you have a lot of effluent that bypasses your wastewater treatment plant. So here's an example with phosphorus for a watershed in, um, in the Toronto region. What you see is if you're thinking about the annual time scale, so this is um, the first uh, bar that you have. If you're thinking about the annual time scale, and if you're thinking about how much comes out uh, of a watershed, the effluent is a significant portion of that budget because uh, it is so close to the water body. A smaller component is bypass and runoff. However, when you go to a particular storm event, so this is within a period of 24 hours, bypass becomes the biggest, biggest component of the nutrient flux into the system. In fact, there's the study, the uh, jet, this, this uh, wastewater treatment plant right in here, we found that approximately 27% of phosphorus effluent comes through bypasses in just over 128 hours, so 1.4% of the year. So you have these really hot moments and hot spots in inputs of nutrients to the lakes. And again, this is places where during large storm events, there is ways for managing these systems more effectively. Okay, so coming into, um, the last question that kind of rounds up this work. So we, we talked about how these urban areas cycle nutrients. We talked about how they impact uh, the nearby ecosystems, but what are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities of creating a more circular nutrient economy and reducing the flux of nutrients to land, um, lakes and landfills? So, so as an so what we did here is after we created the this uh, box and narrow diagram of nutrient inputs and outputs uh, in the Greater Toronto area, we then focused our attention on certain components of the nutrient budget where we felt that there was opportunities. 
So the first one was landfill. Like I said, and this is where I'm looking at phosphorus, there's a huge amount of nutrient that to phosphorus that goes into a landfill. A smaller portion is composted. And uh, we all know about our green bin program. Um, there has been more and more effort in thinking about banning food waste from landfills. Right now, despite the green bin for program, there's a huge amount of food waste that does still go to landfill. The question is, can we harness that source effectively? Can we, instead of sending a lot of it to landfill, figure out ways to, uh, to use them effectively as fertilizer, both, both in our um, urban lawns as well as in the nearby rural area. And we found that if you, if you take those numbers and do that math, you can find that Greater Toronto area can eliminate fertilizer imports with increased compost and biosolid use. Of course, this is not an easy question to say how you will operationalize this because it means creating a central composting facility from where you can actually transport some of that fertilizer to the nearby rural area. So it is a little bit more of a transportation and logistics problem. But one of the things we found is that this will also reduce landfill waste by 43% for nitrogen and 84% for phosphorus. So that's also really important because again, landfill area is really at a premium and um, we really need to figure out more efficient ways of handling some of the landfill waste. Um, so so to, to kind of conclude this talk, uh, there's a couple key takeaways that I want you to take from here. One is human influences dominate urban nutrient budget. Pet waste, lawn fertilizers, food inputs, and food waste. So policies and strategies to deal with some of these more effectively will allow us uh, to um, contribute to more uh, efficient resource uh, recyclings. The other major input is that food imports dominate inputs, but the waste is treated and has a much lower environmental impact than uh, things like pet waste, things like lawn fertilizers. So those are the more important components to focus your energy on. Again, bringing you back to this map. So this is showing you that there is a lot of pet waste that's concentrated along uh, the lake shore and this uh, creates a risk. Uh, we found like it's two to three times more near the lake shore than in nearby rural areas. And finally, better composting manure and biosolid reuse could eliminate the need for fertilizer imports while reducing landfill exports significantly. So this is examples of things we did. We had the urban, suburban, and rural areas for both nitrogen and phosphorus. We calculated, we figured out, estimated, used different databases to figure out what the cycling, what the magnitudes of these arrows were. So the two blue scenarios are the current scenarios. And then we created these future scenarios where uh, we use, uh, we compost a lot more and create a more circular economy and thus uh, reduce a lot of the impact of the GTA on the natural environment. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and. Um, would love to ask if you have questions. So thanks, Nandita, for that presentation. Um, we'll now move to the Q&A portion of the session. So we'd encourage everybody, if you have questions, to please post those to the Q&A box. And if you have other input or thoughts on how this might be useful to your own organization or your own work, um, we'd encourage you to share those in the chat box as well. Um, so our first question, Indita, comes from Dorian Cushman. And okay. her question is, most residential fertilizer does not have phosphorus included. See the zero code for um, the NPK on the picture in one of your slides. So why then was phosphorus included um, for lawn surplus in urban areas? Um, so, so there is, uh, there is uh, some, um, so, so we um, took the 
uh, fertilizer spending database, and that gave us information on how much of what kind of fertilizers were used. And based on that, we used uh, we used those numbers to convert uh, them to. So it's less, but uh, but based on the spendings, we use those varieties of fertilizer and the phosphorus in them. Thanks. Our next question um, is wondering how your modeling efforts here were calibrated and evaluated and if there's um, uncertainty included in some of these estimates. Um, there is uncertainty is uh, uh, included in these estimates. Uh, there's no calibration validation per se because this is more input um, estimation. Uh, so we are, we are pretty much saying what are the inputs and what are the outputs. We didn't model them in, uh, in any way yet, uh, though uh, that some point this is going to go into some kind of modeling. But right now, it's basically we quantified uh, the inputs and outputs independently. Uh, but we did estimate some of the uncertainties of the inputs and outputs based on available data that I haven't gone into. And the second part of that question is, um, could you compare pair input per capita for cities in rural areas. Um, so there's other programs for cycling um, circular economies in Europe. So they're wondering if there's um, potential to move in that direction for the Toronto region. Yes, yeah, so, so most of our literature review, there's a huge amount of circular economy work, work that has been done in Europe, is being done in Europe. And, um, and I, I mean, I, I, uh, I think it's necessary to move in those directions with cities like Toronto, where we actually do more resource recycling. And I think technology is still trying to figure out what are the most efficient ways of doing it. But based on these results, we see that there is a, it is a significant component of the budget um, and thus needs to be considered more effectively. Thanks. Um, our next question is from Keith Reed, and he's wondering if the phosphorus concentration in turf fertilizers was converted from percent P205 to just percent P. It was converted to percent P. I remember having that conversation. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next, uh, our next question, um, they noticed that effluent was a major output generated for nitrogen and phosphorus on an annual basis. Um, is this treated effluent? It is treated effluent. And keep in mind, we selectively uh, lo selected a location in a watershed where effluent was a big component because we were trying to ask the question in those regions, what is the relative proportion? So this is this, that proportion was not based on the entire um, GTA area. It was one watershed within the GTA area where there was a wastewater treatment plant and we were trying to uh, figure out uh, at that location. So we had a wastewater treatment plan input data. We had the stream data right there. And based on those, we were able to figure out that the effluent was a large fraction for that stream data. But it is treated effluent. Great. Um, next. There's a lot of open public debate about who's contributing phosphorus loading um, to lakes, especially for lakes like Lake Erie. Is it cities and urban areas or rural areas and farms? So with that in mind, where do you think we need to put our focus based on sources of environmental impact? Okay, so this is this is also a favorite topic of mine because I think I think it's important to know what the sources are to be able to manage them, and that's where a lot of our mass balance work comes from. So this is not something I presented today, but in some of our mass balance work around Lake Erie, I would argue that uh, the ag component is at, at at the whole basin scale. The ag component uh, definitely surpasses uh, the uh, urban area just because. Uh, spatially, it's way, way more extensive than an urban area. What an urban area, though, does is, is provides these local point source inputs. So that's why they are more important when you have a source discharging into the stream or a city that's 
built on a, a lake shore, uh, you have these point discharges that cause local point uh, eutrophication issue or cladophora issues and things like that. Uh, so cities, I feel, are more local questions, whereas if you're talking about uh, algal blooms in the Lake Erie and total phosphorus load that's coming in on Lake Erie, um, should we worry about the cities? Uh, and I would say there, uh, they form a much smaller component of the budget because most of the inputs of cities do get routed through your wastewater treatment plants and we've gotten pretty good at handling them. Once upon a time, before the 1970s, before we had all our wastewater treatment efficient uh, operations or phosphorus bans, they were the bigger component of the budget. But now I think it's more the ag at the whole basin scale. Thanks. Next, um, someone is wondering, what, what were the primary sources for detergent inputs? Were they from individual consumers or industrial inputs? Um, it was uh, it was individual consumers. We we estimated detergents based on um, population and um, a population density and um, detergent use as a function of population density and detergent phosphorus levels. Um, we did not consider industrial uses, so probably that number will go up. Kind of along those lines again, um, Pradeep Goel has a question. His question is, um, what were your main assumptions about phosphorus inputs in urban areas? And what additional data um, could you use to try and improve these assumptions and reduce overall uncertainty? Um, I think one of the, I mean, I think the two biggest sources where we, we argued for hours and hand wait for hours because there's a lot of uncertainty is I think the urban uh, fertilizer components of the, in well, there was many actually. There's urban fertilizer components of the inputs that is that's uncertain. There's pet waste that's uncertain. Another piece is, is bypasses and magnitude of the bypasses. One of the things we wanted to do as an, as an output was really consider the bypasses but we don't have that information at the scale of greater Toronto area. We have local information. So things like that uh, was, was definitely uh, not possible to constrain. So CSOs are another thing which is really difficult to con um, constrain. Our next question is from Chris Parsons. Um, he wants to know, was phosphate added to drinking water supplies included in the budget? Um, for example, um, phosphate added to reduce lead contamination. Yes. So it's interesting, Chris, that you bring that up. So uh, initially it wasn't, um, but Melanie presented this work at some place and, um, and one, somebody brought that up. So we actually went back and did the calculation. We estimated the phosphate added and we found that it didn't really contribute. So I've not talked about it because it was less than 1% or less than 0.1% of the budget. So it was a really small amount, but we did consider it to begin with. Great. Um, folks, if you have other questions, we'd encourage you to add those to the Q&A. Um, I will move on to our next question, though. Um, what seems to be really innovative related to this project is the systems approach to identifying nutrient flows, um, where you consider a range of issues from pet waste to food management. Um, can you think of additional nutrient sources that you would want to add? that maybe you had to leave out because of lack of data? Um, so I would say CSOs, uh, combined sewer overflows, is something that we would have loved to, and we did try quite a, quite a bit on that path, but there was, it, was, it, it wasn't an easy component. There's also a lot of assumptions we made about fertilizer application rates, so more data there would definitely, uh, would definitely be uh, really valuable. Um, we also focused on mostly the food waste system. We did not consider the vehicular part of the budget or, or we also did not consider um, 
clothing and nitrogen and phosphorus in there. So those all would add to the landfill waste, something we did not. So this is kind of the food part of it, but there's actually more landfill waste um, than this. And there were also assumptions made in the way we, we said how much food is wasted and how much. So there's, there's each, each one of these pieces has information, um, but there's also lacking. But I think CSOs was one of the most pieces that we know it's really important, but um, the numbers are, uh, are not, um, there are some numbers which we use, but not, not uh, too good. Thanks. Um, next question is, based on all of this work, um, is there recommendations that you could come up with for maybe how city residents or municipalities could reduce their inputs or to better recycle nutrient? So for example, better pet waste management or guidance for fertilizer applications for golf courses, for example? Thank you, that's a really good question. Yeah, so I, I think one of the findings I would say for me, for one of the key takeaways is we all know in a broad kind of way, well, it's good to pick up pet waste, you shouldn't fertilize your lawns. But one of the things that these kinds of numbers give us, it tells us what is the magnitude of the impact, which I think is important from a communication perspective. The fact that pet waste is a really significant component of the budget tells you that yes, picking up pet waste, uh, if it's done in a more city-wide way, will have an impact. Um, similarly, uh, one of the biggest, um, biggest waste uh, generation is landfills, and, and, and that also has tremendous potential for recycling. So there's food waste that goes into landfills, so there's way, waste, and a lot of organizations are working on food waste minimization. So that's one of the other pathways that's much easier, uh, oh, sorry, not easier, it's not easier, but that's one of the pathways that's, uh, that if you tackle, it would lead to a significant impact. And the other is resource recovery, right? So there is value in thinking about landfill for all the phosphorus that's there in landfill. Can we access them? And as we are moving more and more towards a, a world in which these resources, phosphorus, will be limited, uh, it becomes more and more important to create strategies of effective recycling of that waste. So from an individual practice perspective, thinking about uh, composting your food waste, thinking about um, not uh, wasting less food, but thinking about better management of different industrial operations in which food, is, food waste is managed. Uh, but from an individual perspective, thinking about your pets and specifically if you're going for a walk on the beach, thinking that a pet waste there is probably much more detrimental to the aquatic system than if I was going uh, hiking on a forested area far in, in shore. So while, while picking up pet waste is important, where the pet waste is also changes your responsibility on how uh, how you uh, manage that and the fact that it has a strong effect on the water quality. Excellent, thanks for those comments. Um, another question from Aaron Harkins. Did your research indicate that leachate from landfills is still a major nutrient contributor? And if so, are these hopefully just older landfills? Good question, and you actually brought me to something that I uh, that I should have mentioned in in one of the fluxes that um, we hand waved our way around and did not estimate. So we estimated what goes to land to landfills, but there is a fraction of the leachate from landfill that shows up. What is that fraction? It's really poorly constrained, so it was not possible to find any numbers. I know that Jim Roy at Environment Canada has been working on landfills and others have been working on landfills. So it would be, it would be good to really understand. I mean, landfill technology has become much more sophisticated in the recent past. And now we actually don't um, add more land in landfill in the GTA area. We just don't have it. A lot of it is shipped outside. Uh, talk about external responsibilities, but um, but the older landfills do leach and we really don't have a good estimate about what is the contribution of that leachate to the aquatic system. And our next question, was the large amount of consumed food phosphorus going to landfills, was that biosolids or was that something else? 
Um, so what we did for that, or what Melanie did for that analysis, is she took the wastewater treatment plant data. So every wastewater treatment plant uh, has its set of files that you could find information on what fraction of it goes to biosolid and what fraction of to be land applied and what fraction goes to landfill. And we use those numbers. So it goes both places. Part of it goes to biosolids and part of it goes to landfills. And here is again one way of effective recycling if we could. Um, convert more to biosolids and use them as fertilizers. Um, and I have one more question that we'll end on, which is kind of a, a big question, but a good one to end on, I think, which is what's next? So does this research help point to where we might need more innovations? So for instance, creating new technologies to collect pet waste or to promote more composting or things like that? Yeah, so so that's that's definitely one of the spaces in which uh, in which this research points to more efficient ways of recycling from a city management perspective. Um, I come from a background of water quality modeling, so part of part of the motivation for me for this work was also to think about how these nutrients impact the water quality, but thinking about them as inputs to a water quality modeling framework. The other thing that uh, in another project of ours we are working on is stormwater ponds around urban areas and how a lot of these pollutants actually run off to those stormwater ponds and create, um, create eutrophication in those ponds. Uh, so thinking about, again, taking a systems approach, thinking about the system together and thinking about different pieces of the system and how things that we are doing related to our pets or related to our lawn fertilizers can impact not only uh, the lake shore but also local water bodies around. Excellent. So thanks, Nandita, for your insightful presentation and for your uh, comments on all of our questions today. Um, so thanks to everybody else for participating, and we hope that this discussion here has been insightful for you as well. So we'd like to end with one last poll for today, which is, did you learn something during this webinar that will inform some of your work moving forward? Um, so I'll leave that for a moment to let everybody have a chance to respond. That's nice to see 81% of people said yes. So um, that's positive for us. So we're glad that you um, learned something from this session today. Um, Nandita, I'll just ask if you move to the last slide. So we'd ask for you to please stay tuned for upcoming webinars from us. If you've missed any webinars in this series so far, recordings are all available on our website and the recording for this session will also be posted there shortly. Um, we'll be sending you a follow-up email with a recording um, as well as a brief survey directly following this webinar that we'd appreciate your feedback on. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Nandita Basu today for her presentation. And I would also like to thank my colleague, Nancy Gaucher, um, for helping organize this series and for producing this session behind the scenes today. Um, thank you to all of our participants for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Kristen and Nancy for organizing and coordinating and thank you all for, uh, for listening in and uh, for the very insightful questions. <laughs>